a little known fact that among uh, Boris's uh, many predictions, he also predicted the economic meltdown of uh, 2008 and the uh, movements that followed uh, Occupy uh, Wall Street and the 99% uh, movement. It's so little known that even Boris don't know it. But uh, we took a flight uh, together to LA in, two, in 1998. And Boris told me a short story. I'm sure many of you know, so I'll be very quick about it. Uh, the story is how Rothschild became uh, so rich. And uh, he was a young man uh, in Paris. And uh, he used to go to the south of Paris, to the uh, poor people's market, and buy one apple for one cent. And it was dirty and not very appealing. So he cleaned it and polished it, drove to the northern part of uh, Paris, where rich people live. And he would sell it for two cents. And then he would drive back to the south part of Paris and buy two apples, do the same thing. So he did it for two weeks. And his father died and left him a billion dollars. So that's, <laughs> that's the story. And I think it sums up everything we know about uh, capitalism now. <laughs> OK. Um, and I don't know about you. Uh, this I found on the internet. Uh, this is actually a photograph or uh, an, an image of uh, Nathan Rothschild. And I think there's always more than... Okay. So I'll start by thanking the collaborators that helped me uh, on the experimental side of this uh, uh, work. I'm a member of... Um, my group, and uh, yes. So I want to talk about the superconductor insulator transition far from equilibrium. And we start, of course, with the superconductor insulator itself. Needs no introduction here uh, with this famous uh, graph from Alan Goldman's group, where the system, some disordered superconductors can undergo a direct transition from a superconducting to an insulating state as you vary a parameter in the system such as the thickness or the carrier concentration or the level of disorder or in the case which I will focus on magnetic field. And this has already uh, been known for a while. Um, this is the, uh, I think the first uh, work of uh, Hebert and Palanen where they've seen a transition from superconducting state to the insulating state as a function of uh, magnetic field. In our case, uh, these days it looks a bit better. The new, one of the new, well, it was already there, but one of the new aspects that people maybe paid less attention to was the fact that the insulator only lives over a narrow range of magnetic field. You can see it here where we plot the resistance as a function of magnetic field. We have a big insulating peak which subsides at the higher magnetic fields. So the theoretical uh, sense, I think, since the, the early 90s and moving on is that the, this insulating state somehow still have remnant of superconductivity in it. And uh, this uh, superconductivity is also probably responsible for the fact that we have an insulating state, which is uh, comes out in uh, all those theoretical uh, works that uh, experimentally there are a lot of evidence right now building up to show that this is actually true. Uh, many types of experiment, tunneling experiment, transport, microwave studies uh, have shown that there is a, a Cooper pair still existing in the insulating state. I just briefly mentioned this uh, this work in which we follow the work of uh, Jim Wallace's group uh, by conducting the little uh, Parks experiment in samples where we could go between the superconductor and the insulating state as a function of, of annealing. So I'm being a bit quick here, but I think it's pretty, you take a sample which is multiply connected and you apply a weak magnetic field and you see those oscillations and in the superconducting state, which this sample is because the resistance at B equals zero is zero, 
uh, the oscillations are, are the little pulse oscillation and the periodicity correspond to the charge of a coupe pair. Now, if you go to the insulating, uh, uh, this is the original coupe, uh, a little parks experiment, and you can see that it's peculiarly rather similar. If you go to, to an insulating sample, which is the red sample, you can see that you, even though the resistance is much higher, you still have, this is a, on the log scale, you still have oscillation at the same frequency as you do in the superconducting. So if the frequency of oscillation represents or correspond to a charge of 2E in the superconductor, it is also true in our insulator. Yeah, you can see it here. It's a, a photograph of our sample. It's just a small section. It's just an array, a rather disordered array of holes. Um, just to show you why I'm calling that one a superconductor and the, the other one an insulator, you can see by the temperature dependence at B equals zero that the, obviously one is an insulator, the other, even though the transport on a log scale look not very different. But I think this is, is, is another one of those experiments that show that we have uh, Cooper pairing in this uh, insulating state. So you want to compare the superconductor and the insulator if they are made from similar uh, charge carriers. Why not try to make some sort of comparison? And we did that. You take just your ordinary transport data. This is a resistance, a functional magnetic field, one typical sample. I'll move between samples here. These are all indium oxide uh, rather freely. So don't be mad at me. Uh, what you can see again here is the resistance, the function of temperature. The color represents the temperatures. We have an insulating side and we have a superconducting-like side. And if you plot it on a log scale, the data looks very different, but it's the same data. But this is a different sample. Again, I'm just, but barring that, this is the same data. When you plot the log of the resistance, the function of magnetic field, it, it looks different. There's still a crossing point separating an insulator in a superconductor, if you plot on a log-log scale, you can see that the data looks like a straight line. If you put a ruler to your data, it follows it quite nicely over all the temperature range and over <laughs> several orders of magnitude in, in, in resistance and in magnetic field. This is a, an, another type of ruler show you that we have this uh, straight line uh, behavior. If you're talking about superconductors, this is not surprising. We have a power law dependence. The only thing that changes between temperatures is the slope of those power laws. And so you can concisely describe the transport data by this formula here, where the temperature dependence come only in the power there. The, this can be explained by some vortex uh, physics, if you like. It's all in this uh, 265 pages review. The nice thing is that this power law continues beyond the crossing point into the insulating state, some ways. And so again, showing a relationship uh, between the transport in the, uh, in the superconductor and in the, and in the insulator. But what we find is that if you go to lower temperature, and this is what I would like to focus on today, is what happens when you go to lower temperature, say below 0.2 degrees, that the deviation beginning to develop, but those deviations are only on the insulating side. You can see it quite clearly here. The superconducting side follows the uh, power law quite nicely, all the way down to our noise, and that deviation develop, begin to develop in the insulator. Let me show you this again. So on the right uh, uh, bottom side, you can see the temperature scale, 0.2 to 0.9, and I will add more and more lower temperature, frame by frame, so you can follow. This is the same. Uh, now I switch to uh, uh, two terminal measurements, so the superconducting side kind of uh, disappears. But it's just so that you can easily measure in the insulator. And now we begin to lower the temperature. 
And you can see that not much is happening in the superconducting side, although, as I said, we haven't been showing you this here. But you can see that uh, the resistance traces, this is 33 milli-degrees, this is 13 milli-degrees, the resistance traces just become sharper and sharper as we go to lower and lower temperature. If you want, you can still uh, try to fit a power law there. Uh, and the power is 1,009 for this particular. So let's see, uh, 1,009. So 2 is from uh, phase space consideration. 3 you get from uh, electron uh, phonon, uh, phonon population. And so that leaves 1,004 to go. So obviously, this seems almost uh, discontinuous. But we didn't pay attention to that at the beginning. This was 2005 or 2004 when we were starting to work on this. Um, we really didn't pay attention to this low temperature uh, data that much. What we did do is we measured the current voltage characteristics in our sample. That's what you want to do if you have a sample where you are measuring transport. One of the things you want to do. And so you take one of those insulating states, uh, a particular sample, and you fix your magnetic field value and you measure the current voltage characteristics. This is the current versus voltage. And you can see you have insulating like strongly nonlinear behavior, but nothing radical. Not different from any insulator you usually see. If you plot it uh, on a log scale, this is not the derivative, but it's basically not, not very different. You can see that at 150 milli-degrees, that depends on the sample, I guess, the data is still continuous. But once you go to 50 milli-degrees, suddenly the data becomes discontinuous, quite abrupt change of the conductivity. Um, as a function of voltage at a given voltage uh, threshold. This is uh, newer data, but uh, the same thing. You see you have hysteresis. You, this is on log scale, so you increase. Uh, initially, you follow the black ohmic line, and then the small deviation, and suddenly a big jump into a, a different conductance uh, branch at much higher current. These jumps can exceed the five orders of magnitude. This seems interesting to us. So uh, <clears throat> we published this paper. Uh, and then it was also seen in titanium nitride. We called it collective insulating state. I don't even know why. I didn't, you know, something was needed. Um, but then the, uh, this was taken even uh, further, I guess. Uh, and uh, Vinokur and Baturina explained this with some sort of a super insulating state that is mirroring the superconducting states in some way which I don't really understand. You can read it in Wikipedia. Around the same time when we were making our measurements, uh, three uh, theorists, A, B, B, and A, B, C, uh, were working on, on something else altogether. Where is the Dennis? Not here. <laughs> and uh, they published this very interesting paper, which I read very carefully. Uh, here is, uh, this is page 32. But they realized rather quickly that uh, it's not going to be very uh, approachable to experimentally. So they wrote this paper for the experiment. This is just four pages. And there are also pictures. So you could try to read that, even though we didn't. <laughs> Um, so what they say in this paper is that if you look for 
experiment and manifestation of many body localization, you want to see that even in the presence of weak coupling of phonons, meaning that not totally zero, uh, transition will manifest itself in nonlinear conductance leading to bistable IV curve. And they also pointed out in that paper that uh, this similar stuff has been observed in uh, yttrium selenide, which have nothing to do with superconductivity. And uh, a year later, we sort of uh, got uh, together, and uh, they wrote this paper referring uh, to our work in which they looked at those uh, discontinuities in the IV in a different uh, view from what we were uh, used to, and that is involving the heat balance equation. What is the heat balance equation? You assume that you have no equilibrium, you have a steady state, you apply external heat, this external heat goes to the electrons. The electrons transfer the heat to the phonons, and they transfer the heat to the substrate. That's basically what happens in our experiment. You put a lot of power into the electronic system. That power is dissipated to the phonons, and then to the substrate, which is connected to our fridge. You can write this mathematically <coughs> with this uh, heat balance equation. And there are several assumptions in the theoretical paper. Two of them I will mention here because I think they're nice. The first one is that the IV is linear, which is kind of odd if you look at the data. Uh, and the apparent nonlinearity comes from the fact that the electron can have a different temperature, higher temperature than the phonon, quite significantly so. The second point is that R as a function of T is a fast function, and that if you put those two ingredients into the heat balance equation and you solve it uh, numerically, you can get a regime at low enough phonon temperature where there are two stable solutions for the electron temperature, for the same phonon temperature. Uh oh. Yes. And you write this equation a bit uh, simpler. This is an implicit equation relating the electron temperature and the phonon temperature, and you can solve it, and you get a nice graph like that, and you can see uh, bounded inside the black curve is the regime where you cannot, is, is the excluded regime for, for temperature of the electrons. And from that assumption, you can generate data. Which one is ours? That one is ours. This is the, the, from the theory that looks, that mimics the experimental result quite, uh, quite well down to some even uh, uh, fine uh, details. So they published, uh, we beat them with one, one page to the publication. Uh, um, to make a, a, a better comparison, you can try to, un under the assumption of the, uh, under those assumptions that we talked about, you can try to determine the electron temperature from your measured IV. So here's an example of how you do it. So you measure your IV at a given phonon temperature. Then nothing happens. Oh, something is missing. OK, so you take a point there, an I and a V at a high temperature branch. It's missing from this graph. I, I don't know what. And you transfer it to your resistance as a function of temperature or inverse temperature, which you measure in the ohmic regime. OK, so now this is your thermometer. It's the measurement of the electronic system in the ohmic regime. And so you take a V over I value over there. You transfer it here. It comes 2 times 10 to the 7. You find this value on this graph. And then you can determine the electron temperature at the high voltage uh, measurement by comparing the, the V and I, V divided by I value to those that you measure in uh, the ohmic regime. So we're using the ohmic regime as our thermometer. And this is the data. You can convert it to electron temperature. And in our experiment, you can actually see quite clearly this excluded uh, region. And I'm going fast here, I know, but there's a lot uh, to say. <laughs> But you can see the theoretical excluded region, and in our experiment, really, the electron temperature don't, you cannot find temperatures in this region similar to what uh, has been predicted. 
So we've been looking at it for some years, <coughs> and maybe it would be, it has been, it is obvious. But the, the physical picture is, is uh, rather simple, right? So since we have this very strong nonlinear, a very strong temperature dependent of the resistance, <clears throat> and the electron and phonons are weakly coupled, you can uh, have a situation where the electron has an elevated temperature above the phonon. And it so turns out that if you solve this uh, heat balance equation, <clears throat> there's a bistable region. The, the temperature can abruptly change. So to me, that meant that the entire electron system have their own temperature because the electrons are interacting with each other. They can sustain their own temperature separate from the phonon temperature in a non-equilibrium situation maintained by the voltage or by the power that experimentalists apply. So there's heat flow into the electrons, and it's quite strong, right? Because the electron can be at 300 milli-degrees when the crystal is at 10. And the heat flows from the electron to the phonons, but I can still define a temperature for the electrons and a separate temperature for the phonons. Uh, so this is uh, basically, again, the same data. We're just removing some the axis here. And let me show you, if you turn it over, you move it to the side, it looks very much like the graph on the left. Uh, even the same colors. Uh, the graph on the left is a solution, is a mathematical solution to the Van der Waals equation for the liquid gas mixture. Don't need to remind you that, including the Maxwell construction. Here is pressure versus density for, for a liquid gas mixture. And again, you can see the striking similarity between the two uh, systems. One is measured very far from equilibrium in a, in a system which is quantum uh, uh, near t equals zero. And another one is a liquid gas transition for which Van der Waals won a Nobel Prize 100 years ago. So what does it mean? Ah, it means that we may be able to define an order parameter. Um, I'll go quickly because we haven't done the experiment properly so far. You can measure critical exponent if you want because you have a critical point, second order like critical point. And let me show you a movie. This is the critical point of, uh, I forgot, with methane, I think, or some mixture of liquid and gas. And what's nice about that if you are at a critical point and you do your experiment slowly, you take two fluids, a gas and a liquid. They are intermixed above TC, and you lower the temperature. Both of them are transparent, but near the critical point, they become opaque. And this is called the critical opalescence. Now you can see meniscus forming. And the reason they become opaque, of course, is that because we have intermixture of the different densities over all length scales. That's what it means to be near a second order uh, phase transition. So if you take this point of view and you believe the similarity between the appearance of the graphs or RIVs and the Van der Waals solution is not accidental, you have to take into account that something similar is happening in our system. Meaning that you no longer can think about the electron as being at one temperature. There has to be a mixture of several different, temp many different temperatures, perhaps, in, in the sample, which, if you want to think in terms of currents rather than temperatures, you can do that too, because the current path in a sample, when you, when you undergo this, uh, this continuous jump, which is like lightning, basically, if you want to think about it, it's not going to, it cannot be a uniformly affected throughout all the electrons. There are going to be some weak links that are going to be hotter, quicker than other places where the higher resistance is. So we must have, uh, we must be able to accommodate somehow, I think, uh, a way to incorporate this into the, all right, so the last bit, I have some time left, Omicron spot. <clears throat> and this is again, after several years of thinking and, and, and again coming from the, uh, collaboration with the theoretical group, uh, we began to put a lot of effort into extending our ability to measure resistances into high uh, value at low temperature so we can follow. And this is an example. We get to 10 to the 12 ohms and even higher 
in some cases. This is not continuous measurement. These are measurements that you fix the temperature in the magnetic field and you scan your IV and you extrapolate your IV as best as you can to V equals zero to obtain uh, uh, the value of the resistance. And again, you see this sharp rise near BC, near the critical point. Uh, yeah, this is uh, some sort of uh, semi-observation of uh, the Baturina group where the resistance is also increasing rather rapidly. But let me show you our data. This is the summary of the data that we have um, plotted on an Arrhenius plot. And you can see that the dashed line is a straight line, but almost none of the curves are straight. So we have two types of behavior. So let's see what's what. So this is activation behavior. It's a straight line on this graph. If you go to lower fields near the critical point of that superconductor integrated transition, you get something that is much faster than activation. But if you go to 12 Tesla, which is our highest field in this experiment, you get something that is slower than activation. So let's start with that. Let's start with the high field, 12 Tesla, in this uh, regime where the insulating peak is already becoming weaker. We see something that looks like uh, Efros uh, Shlovsky hopping over several orders of magnitude. Now you go to the other extreme. And again, this is going faster than exponential. This is the low field. If you plot contactivity, you see that it's sort of indecided. It goes uh, rather weakly with temperature until you get to 0.1 degrees. And then the resistance drops very sharply, approaching some temperature. You try to fit it to uh, an exponential. It's not working. What does work is some sort of an exponential with the shifted uh, temperature scale, T star. You can see here. Now, this is a, please note the number of orders of magnitude of this. Uh, and you can see comparison between the 12 Tesla data, a conductance, and the 0 0.75 Tesla data. And you can see how sharp it is. This is all below 0.3 degrees, right? So when you get to 0.1, there's Four orders of magnitude separate them, but by 0.4, they're equal. 0 0.04, sorry. Uh, this is a parameter. OK. <clears throat> so the question is whether this uh, apparent disappearance of the conductance uh, is an indication of the many body localization. This is a graph from their papers. And again, we, we are not sure yet. And this is a comparing uh, superconductivity transition <clears throat> in one of our cleaner samples with a TC of uh, a little bit more than two to this uh, uh, transition of conductance. So this is resistance and that is conductance. <clears throat> and you can judge for yourself. Uh, this is published yesterday after two years of... Uh... So thank you for your attention. <clears throat>